Finn. Um, I think they will show my slides. And you can just make it in presentation mode, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you can, next slide. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to be here again to um, speak with you all and provide the key takeaways from this morning until just now that we finished the breakout sessions. And it's quite challenging to uh, try and incorporate everything in such a short time. Um, so I hope that I, I do justice and uh, apologies if uh, some of the points have not been captured, but I, I am trusting that this would, would cover most of it. So um, this morning, um, we, we learned basically the, the whole framework about a free prior and informed consent. It is an international standard protected by international human rights law in terms of all people's right to self-determination and participation in decision-making, particularly recognizing that which will affect uh, people's well-being. It is a right to process. And uh, as, uh, as Oxfam had also provided us with the, the framework and the definitions and the context for free, what is free, what is prior, what is informed and what is consent, um, key points around that would be that the, that the process is free from manipulation or co coercion. There's a process that uh, prior to the consultation and the engagement with communities, a prior process that would be within the um, community and also following their traditional uh, governance process. Uh, informed being that it is facilitative and there is a sharing of objectives that are accurate and easily um, understandable and finally it allows for the right to say no um, to provide the yes or no to a particular project. Foremost uh, another um, context or definition about FPIC is that foremost it's a safeguard which has its origins according to the universal rights of indigenous peoples and in recent years it has become part of the social safeguards framework in climate change related agreements. In many cases, it's already captured in national policy and regular, regulatory frameworks. However, it still remains to be limited. Next slide, please. So where have we gained these takeaways? Uh, I think I may not have exhausted every, everyone or mentioned everyone here, but uh, we, we find the logos of all the organizations, including also companies, um, that have presented earlier. And um, thank you for, for giving us uh, all these uh, examples of FPIC in practice. And we heard from uh, this morning from Oxfam in developing practical approaches to FPIC in the Mekong countries, the public private partnership on Red Plus in the coffee sector in Vietnam with Cafe Red and the Burapa agroforestry case. And then there's several from the breakouts, examples and inputs from CSO presentations in context of conservation, protected management, and others. One of the um, major thing, uh, kind of the, the overarching message um, from this morning was that FPIC is possible to gain. Um, it is not a zero sum uh, game, that um, it's something that we, we cannot uh, avoid. Um, but uh, more so from Kim Lai, uh, it is important, particularly in the Mekong region where um, there are many, uh, there's a, a, a significant proportion of indigenous and ethnic populations in the region from which yeah, the, the origins of ethnic is really, is really uh, uh, in terms of responding and respecting their rights. Next slide, please. So um, okay, so um, I have five key takeaways, and the first one is that uh, FPIC could easily be seen as a challenging process, that it's costly and could be a bed of conflict and distrust. There's lack of clarity in laws and institutions to enforce FPIC, and this uh, this lack of clarity may co may contribute to this um, conflict and and distrust. 
But um, uh, there are also instances where many countries have national laws meant to ensure just processes of land transfer consistent with the requirement to obtain FPIC. But few have yet adopted national laws that explicitly mention FPIC as an obligation. But FPIC requires that communities can meaningfully participate in decision-making process and that their concerns, priorities, and preferences are accommodated in project designs, indicators, and outcomes. This may require more time at the start of a project, but we heard also from the speakers earlier that ultimately in the end, um, if this is taken up, uh, it could lead to avoidance of disputes over land and resources claims later on. And um, there was also an argument that cost of conflict could in fact be much more costly for uh, companies and therefore it's um, uh, better to, to be addressing this. And at the end of the day, it's also a good return on investment. Um, next uh, takeaway is that uh, as a process, consultations must be done in good faith and should be genuine among government, private sector and communities. Some examples are already demonstrating this and we can build from this. In the example of a public private partnership on Red Plus in the coffee sector in Vietnam, promoting deforestation free coffee and sustainable coffee agroforestry models, we learned that uh, by using uh, community engagement and making that an ongoing process is quite important and is required. In fact, we even heard um, uh, one of the companies uh, mentioned that it's already ingrained in their DNA to actually be, be, be doing this. Um, this can provide opportunities to build more experience on the practical application of FPIC. Um, we also heard um, uh, Graham also mentioned about um, profitability is equated to responsibility. Um, uh, Oxfam also showing their um, their community engagement index where there are already some companies uh, exactly in the Mekong region that's already saying yes to FPIC. And so hopefully that this would um, still, uh, that this would continue. Um, uh, okay. The, the, third, um, the third takeaway would be that uh, meaningful engagement in various forms, such as structured and multiple dialogues at different levels, accessible and appropriate communication would constitute good practice. Uh, apologies that the slide got cut, um, but uh, a tangible result of good FPIC practices can be the building of community engagement and trust among stakeholders contributing to inclusive and gender sensitive participation of communities in decision-making processes that affect them and thereby the long-term sustainability of the investment um, or project. As mentioned earlier, a meaningful engagement could also be around um, putting it in the project cycle of the companies and making it an ongoing uh, process rather than it just being kind of a tick in the box and just at the onset or outset of a project and not really continually um, consulting and engaging with the communities. Um, there is also a, a, an important message from the breakout group that I joined about meaningful engagement, that it is not only about being legalistic and legalistic in the interpretation of the guidelines or what FPIC is all about, but it should really be an embedded understanding of the spirit of FPIC. And so that's that's uh, one of the um, important points that we can take in terms of what is really meaningful and genuine um, genuine FPIC. Um, part of the, I would also add to that in terms of the meaningful engagement and also the forms and types of uh, actions that um, are included in FPIC. It's not only about um, multiple dialogues at different levels, having also um, locally uh, consultation materials in local language, but it also should include um, treatment of the violations um, of uh, the right of, in, of communities and um, where the exercise of ethic might not be um, truly uh, meaningful and genuine, and that um, there should also be proper grievance mechanisms uh, included in that engagement and also the um, 
disclosure processes as part of good practice. The next key takeaway is that it is important to understand the enabling policy and business environment to widen application and practice of FPIC. We must move beyond concept, but as a widely held and applied process from a rights-based perspective. We've also heard in the um, breakout, uh, some of the breakout uh, sessions that there are already opportunities um, and entry points existing nationally and in ASEAN. And uh, even the MRLG program itself could already be a facilitative uh, program for uh, widening and broadening the practice of, of FPIC. Um, the adoption of FPIC, as we know, and as we heard, is already promoted in international instruments. So that can also be part of that enabling policy and business environment. How do we uh, intersect the new um, responsible uh, the guidelines for responsible investments in agriculture, how do we also integrate the other frameworks like the UN SDGs, UNDRIP again, and also uh, the CBD and climate change frameworks. Um, the, next, uh, the next key takeaway, um, hang on, uh, another part of that, um, policy environment, uh, and this was mentioned in the, the breakout, this, that there are potential entry points within ASEAN to advocate for FPIC, and there are particular working groups that already exist that can be tapped. Um, it's also good, there's a quote here um, that I got that um, starting off at the ASEAN level would be quite good to break the ice, and from where we can expand the, the understanding of the spirit of FPIC that beyond just the indigenous peoples, that it's for the good of all society. And um, ha uh, having this due process could also um, be encouraged nationally and that uh, there could be a shared roadmap that could be developed at the regional level. Um, few working groups that exist already that can be uh, good entry points would be the ASEAN Working Group on Social Forestry, the ASEAN Working Group on Agricultural Cooperatives, and also the ASEAN Commission on Human Rights. The last key takeaway is that CSO, Indigenous Peoples, and local communities, ethnic and local communities, still need to increase their capacity and knowledge and ethic to better and strategically advocate and lobby for its full and effective implementation. They need a platform and safe space to raise and discuss experience and importance of ethic and connect with other stakeholders such as the government and private sector to communicate the need for ethic. Um, the one of the um, other aspects to be included within that whole process of capacity building and knowledge building is um, possibly also the development of community protocols, um, conduct assessments on quality FPIC and make this information public. And um, essentially what we need to see is really having um, everyone in the process that's involved have to be at the um, equal level of capacity and knowledge and understanding about the process and more so also with the indigenous people, ethnic and local communities for them to also be able to um, build their ownership of the process and internalize their stake in it. Um, finally, the use of platforms and engagements uh, as mentioned earlier in terms of the entry points could still be used in the next couple of years. I'll leave you with a slide that um, Oxfam had shared with us, which gives also um, some very basic key points. Uh, the top line is basically one of the, the deeper spirit of uh, FPIC is that the community has a right to decide. And uh, communities have rights, but FPIC involves everyone. Um, so that's the key takeaway. And then a last request. Next slide. Um, we are all invited to um, join, uh, I mean, to uh, participate in a, in a consultation uh, by going into menti.com. 
Uh, it says here, we, in our, we are in a unique position to have a gathering of more than 700 experts on land issues here in the Mekong. We cannot miss this chance to get a snapshot of your opinions on some of the issues presented here. There has been, uh, there will be two polls during the forum, one took place already yesterday and the other one is scheduled for today. So for today, uh, the we have here the code 7414342233. Please 